said last time that I was going to try and do two books per video, but I also said if it starts to get dense, we're not going to do that uh, for the sake of time, and things get very dense here in book three, so we're only going to cover the one book tonight. We'll see what we do going forward with the rest. If you haven't watched the previous video on books one and two that I did, I would recommend you do so because there's going to be some follow-up points, uh, some ongoing conversations, certainly some of the things that we talked about in terms of the introduction to the poem are going to be relevant in all of these videos, so that would be my recommendation. But if not, welcome. Just uh, enjoy book three. So, we, uh, we can really divide book three up into three different parts. Okay, so there is, at the beginning, a brief invocation of the muse, again, just like we have at the beginning of book one. Then we have a fairly big chunk, about half the book devoted to this scene in heaven, particularly the conversation between the father and the son. And then finally, we have, we catch up with old Scratch and his magical trip to earth, where we left uh, Satan last time as he was making all sorts of new friends, uh, traveling through chaos and night on his way to Earth, and he will finally get there, and uh, we'll see what goes on with his journey in there. Okay, so what we're going to find, though, is that primarily, in terms of follow-up from last time, we're going to see two things that we get some more information on, two questions that we, we explored last time. The first one was... What is going on with Milton's invocation of the muse, given that he associates in book one demons and all non-Christian deities? Particularly, he singles out the Greek pantheon in his list of, uh, uh, of uh, deities that are actually demons within this world. And, of course, the muse is one of the part of the Greek pantheon or the muses, I should say. There are multiple muses within Greek mythology. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Point is that given that, what's going on with his invocation of the muse, we explored some possibilities. Well, we get a little more information here with this invocation in book three. Oh, and then we're also, we're also going to follow up on the whole question of is Satan the real hero of Paradise Lost, given that he does seem to occupy what would be the traditional heroic role. So we'll get some development on that point as well. But we're going to start with the muse, because that's where the book starts. Uh, and this is kind of interesting, because before, in book one, there was really no reason to think that Homer was doing anything but invoking the muse in the same sense that Homer did and Virgil did that uh, with, with both of them, they're, they're invoking the deity. And one of the options we explored was that, well, Milton's just argue, or he's echoing a classical style and we shouldn't necessarily connect what he says with the invocation of the muse to his later association with uh, demons and the Greek pantheon. And we still might, I mean, that's still a very viable option, but if we reject that option and say, no, they're both in this poem, so if he's going to do, he, he can't have it both ways, Milton seems to clear things up here. The muse gets associated very strongly with God here at the beginning of book three, and perhaps even more specifically with the Holy Spirit. So in line one, the very first, the, the, the book begins with Milton saying, Hail, holy light, offspring of heaven firstborn. That right there has Trinitarian implications, the whole sense of the firstborn of heaven. That could easily refer to the Son, uh, the second member of the Trinity. It could also refer to the Holy Spirit that in Western theology 
proceeds from the Father and the Son. Augustinian Trinitarian theory, which we're going to talk about, is going to become relevant a little bit later in this book. Have, well, we might actually talk about it uh, in just a couple minutes, but uh, it's, it, it's kind of the whole question of the Trinity and Trinitarian theology becomes relevant throughout this whole conversation in heaven, not just here at the beginning. But within Augustinian uh, theology, the Trinity is the love between the Father and the Son. So there could, you could definitely read into that sense of heaven's firstborn, but even if we reject that, we get the direct quote from 1 John, where in line 3, Milton says, God is light. Okay, so line 1, hail holy light. He hasn't identified holy light as the muse yet. We get that identification several lines down in, in line 19, but he's speaking to the muse at this point. It's the invocation, even though he hasn't identified that he is invoking the muse at this point. And so right there we have a clear identification with the Trinity, possibly, but for sure with God the Father. Okay? Now this could also be, it's, uh, some of the notes I looked at suggest that he could also be referencing here Dante in Paradiso Canto 13 where Dante writes these lines, and of course these are in translation. He says, this is Dante uh, from the Divine Comedy, for the living light that streams forth from the source in such a way that it never parted from him, nor from the love whose mystic force joins them in Trinity. Okay, now Dante's obviously quite dense, so let's break that down a little bit. Here, the living light is referring to the sun, right? And we know that because it streams forth from the source, the source being the Father, and is never parted from him. So we have this eternal bond between the Father and the Son going on in Dante. And then, remember what we just talked about with Augustinian Trinitarian theology, the love joins them, whose mystic force joins them in Trinity. So your Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right there in that line. So now the question becomes, if Milton is actually, actually echoing Dante here, which I'm not 100% convinced he is, because he certainly, you know, like I said, we have the direct quote from 1 John, you know, God is light and in him there is no darkness. Uh, so he could just be riffing off of that, but he also, it, given the amount of uh, respect and honor he's wanting to pay to other epic poets, it certainly wouldn't surprise me if he's pulling in from Dante as well. So if he is, the question becomes, is he also trying to pull in that Augustinian theology that's going on in Canto 13 of Dante's Paradiso? Because Dante certainly is. I mean, what I just read to you is almost directly out of Augustine's De Trinitate, his famous book on the Trinity. So Dante definitely is, but it's an open question, A, whether or not Milton is referencing Dante here, B, if he is, and assuming for the sake of argument that he is, whether or not he is aware of the Augustinian reference. I do think, regardless of where we land on that, that, that what we're going to see throughout this is that Milton does have a strong understanding of Trinitarian theology, which is going to come into play later on in some of the theological intricacies of this book. This book is going to be very theological, by the way, in case you haven't picked that up. Whereas last time we were dealing with some theology, but certainly a lot of Homeric stuff, references to mythology, those are going to be toned way down, especially in the first half of this book, and we're going to focus much more on theological argument. Okay. A couple other things on the muse is that uh, line six, it refers to the light is uncreated. And then in line 19, and this is one of the more curious ones, the muse is re this is where the muse is directly named and called out heavenly, as heavenly muse. It's given that adjective. And this is interesting because I read that, and I when I initially read this, it struck me as being very supportive of what we've just been talking about, the whole idea that in the, what Milton's actually referring to with the muse 
is God, or si at least a heavenly association. But the notes I were looking at, I was looking at, suggest that this could actually be a reference to Urania, who is one of the Greek muses, and in particular is the muse of astronomy. So, again, you know, this is where literature becomes fun, because we can't read Milton's mind, and you could make a strong argument either way. You can make the strong argument from the immediate context of this opening section that that is a reference to heaven as in the Christian heaven, not Greek mythology, or you can make a reference to the fact that Milton is pulling in tons of stuff from Greek mythology, and in this very line he is invoking the muse, that that is a more of a mythological reference rather than a theological reference. So I think you can make a strong argument either way, and I don't necessarily know uh, what my opinion is on that. I, I would have to go back and uh, reread this opening uh, probably a few times to, to really get that sense of uh, where I would land on that. Okay, enough about the muse. Let's talk about God for a second. Specifically, Milton's God, who is an interesting sort of character and one who is a little bit controversial in studies of Paradise Lost. Because, as you saw, if you read Book 3, and as we'll see as we go through this, he comes off as kind of a jerk, especially in how he refers to humans. Uh, he seems very, very cold. Very, even though he does extend grace, he, he there's not a lot of warmth in that. It's more of a technical... Well, humans aren't 100% to blame because of the Satan guy, so I guess they can have grace. So, for a, a lot of people find themselves strongly disliking Milton's God. What I want to suggest is that, well, I understand that argument and I think it's valid. You can't understand Milton's God, at least here in Book 3, without taking into account the theological argument that's taking place within this dialogue that we see, okay? In other words, I don't, I think that if we read into this character development, we're actually misunderstanding what Milton is trying to do. He's staging an argument, not developing a character. So how God comes across is irrelevant to Milton, I believe. And what is actually relevant is the theology that's being expressed. All right, so the Father, the Almighty Father, God, and the Son, who may or may not be God within the context of the poem, we'll get to that in a little bit, have their conversation. Now, before we make a classical Trinitarian mistake here, this is not Jesus. Within, and this is going to be important because it, it proves Milton's understanding of Trinitarian theology, that he never refers to the Son as Jesus. Because within Trinitarian theology, the Son is the second member of the Trinity. Jesus is the Son incarnate in human form. Okay? Now that might seem like a very technical distinction, but from a theological perspective, that's very, very significant. Jesus does not exist until the Incarnation. The Son exists throughout all time, eternal, co-eternal, with the Father, okay? That's how Christian Trinitarian theology, Orthodox Trinitarian theology, works with that. And that's an important distinction. And the fact that Milton never refers to Jesus, he only refers to the Son, shows that he has at least some awareness of Trinitarian theology because he's very careful in his wording here. And that's going to be significant later on. All right, so let's do a little summary of this conversation uh, very briefly, and then we'll break down the theology using several excerpts from the book. So, God... Foresee, he's watching Satan head to earth, and he foresees that humanity's going to fall. And he and the Son have a whole conversation about that. Grace is going to be offered to the humans, 
God asks for volunteers because we still need somebody to go down and take the penalty for what mankind has done. Nobody volunteers except for Jesus. Now, does that scene sound familiar at all? It should, if you've been paying attention so far in the poem. That is a direct echo of what we saw at the end of, towards the end of our middle of book two, when Satan and the demon council have kind of wrapped things up. We're going to go to Earth, and Satan says, who wants to go and scout things out? And he doesn't get any volunteers, and then he volunteers himself. And you'll remember that we talked about how that reinforces Satan as the heroic figure. But here we see the exact same scene play out, and now the sun is the heroic figure. And that's significant to the whole argument of whether or not Satan is the hero because it recasts his earlier action, that scene in the last book, no longer appears heroic in comparison to what the sun has done because Satan's actions are now selfish and corruptible, whereas the sun's, or with the intention of corrupting humanity, whereas the sons are selfless, sacrificial, with the intention of saving humanity. So when you com if we look at Satan's actions in the vacuum, they are heroic. When we look at them in comparison to the sons in book three, they become a parody of heroism, whereas the sons are truly heroic. Okay? So that's the gist of the whole conversation in terms of a summary between the father and the son. But there's a lot of theology going on here. To really understand this, we have to get some theology. Now, John Milton, like I mentioned last time, is an English Protestant. And beyond that, the exact details of his religious life and thought are a little bit sketchy. In particular, what's going to be going on in this dialogue is a whole, or, or in this conversation, is a whole dialogue with Calvinism. That's what Milton's doing here for a lot of this. Not exclusively, but a lot of it. So Calvinism, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, John Calvin was one of the reformers along with Martin Luther. Developed, well, he started the system and his, his disciples after his death kind of developed it into what's thought of Calvinism largely today. And Calvinism is best understood, or at least classically understood, as an acronym, the acronym TULIP. So T-U-L-I-P. Uh, they, each of the five letters in TULIP represents one of the five points of Calvinism. First point, total depravity. Man is after the fall, all bad, 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 bad. Uh, everything in humanity has been corrupted as a result of, uh, of the fall. Uh, two, unconditional election. God elects those who he is going to save. And it's unconditional in the sense that there's nothing any person can do to become one of the elect or to stop being one of the elect. Number three, limited atonement. The atonement, which is Christ's death on the cross, benefits the elect only. So it's a limitation of the atonement is for the elect. Uh, I, irresistible grace. If you are one of the elect, you are unable to resist the call to salvation when it comes to you. And finally, perseverance of the saints, where if you are an elect and you have not resisted that grace, as you cannot within the Calvinist system, and you are not saved, you will and must persevere to the end. Okay? Now, whether or not, whatever you think of that system is irrelevant for this conversation. You can be pro-Calvinist, anti-Calvinist, completely ignorant about Calvinism, just this might be the first you're hearing about it. The point is that Milton's interacting with it, and that's what we're concerned about, not debating the merits of Calvinism. So Milton has a very complex relationship to Calvinism because, on the one hand, a lot of what's going on in this book is a polemic against Calvinist ideals. The first being that the fact that God has foreknowledge of humanity's fall, which has not happened, this is very important, Humanity's fall at this point in the story has not happened, but God foresees that it is going to happen. Okay, so God has, within Paradise Lost, and again, whatever you think of this theologically, doesn't matter, we're interested in analyzing the poem, God has complete knowledge of past, present, and future within the world of Paradise Lost. 
So he sees that humanity is going to fall. He foresees it. And Milton is very careful to point out that foresight does not equate to predestination. So we see this in lines 95 to 99, where God says, So will fall he and his faithless progeny, referring to Adam here, whose fault, whose but his own, ingrate, there's that, uh, warm, loving God that I was describing. In great, he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, but free to fall. Very, very powerful statement there at the end. God has, within the world of the Pope, gave Adam and Eve everything they needed to be sufficient to stand against temptation, but he also gave them the freedom to fall, and foresight doesn't cancel that out. Then in one, lines 112 through 119, God continues, reinforce this, so we're created, nor can justly accuse their maker or their making of their fate. So, in other words, they are created as they are, and because of how they were created, they can't God's not to blame, as if predestination overruled their will disposed by absolute decree or high foreknowledge. They themselves decreed their own revolt. Very significant. So predestination is a decree within Calvin's thought. Predestination is a decree of who will be saved, who won't. And in some forms of Calvinism, that's also taken to the extent that God decrees the fall as well. Merits of that notwithstanding, Milton is clearly interacting with that here. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If I foreknew, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proof certain unforeknown. So foreknowledge, irrelevant. His, and this is where God comes across from a character development standpoint as unappealing, but in, this is very crucial to understand, that from Milton's perspective, this is actually a point in God's favor, because God didn't ordain the fall. So what Milton is arguing against is a version of God that in his opinion, and you, if you're a Calvinist, you don't have to agree with this, but within Milton's opinion, if Calvinism is true, God is a monster because he ordains the fall. That's what he's getting at. So even though God comes across as you ingrates, you know, very cold, very harsh, it's all your fault, that's a really important point because it saves God from the consequences of causing the fall, which would be, for Milton, a far greater corruption of his character than getting pissed off at humanity because they didn't take advantage of their sufficiency to stand up against temptation. All right? Milton also makes sure that, um, but, but now that, that we aren't going to blame God for this, we aren't going to blame his foreknowledge, the buck has been clearly passed. All right? But then we circle back around, because now Milton's, for the sake of saving God's character, Milton has pushed a little bit too far. You know, the, the blame is 100% on humanity at this point. Now he kind of backs off from that. So lines 129 to 133, God says, The first sort, which is referring to the demons, the first sort by their own suggestion fell, self-tempted, self-depraved. So the demons... They have no one to blame but themselves. They tempted themselves, they depraved themselves. Man falls deceived by the other first. Man therefore shall find grace, the other none. In mercy and justice both, through heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel. So now we have to back, we, we've established that God's not to blame, but now we have to back off because humanity can't be 100% to blame either or else they are undeserving of grace. Okay? So, God unfallen, nothing's his fault. No part of the fall is his fault. Either by predestination or guilt or anything. Satan and the demons, 100% their fault. 
So their fall from heaven, their fault. Humanity, it's a mix. It's Satan's fault and humanity's fault. That's what Milton's getting at. And because it's that mix, humanity is now deserving of grace. So both those points, all those points are very much against Calvinism. Milton is undermining this whole sense of God's foreknowledge, of predestination being to blame. But we don't, then he kind of circles back around and starts to, uh, at least in a limited, qualified sense, to embrace some ideas of uh, Calvinism. In particular, the whole concept of election. Remember, tool up the U, unconditional election, that God chooses who will be among the elect, and there's nothing you can do to become an elect or not become an elect. Well, Milton is on, on board with election, at least in a qualified sense. So lines 173 to 80, uh, 184. Man shall not quite be lost, but saved who will, yet not of will in him, but grace in me. Very Calvinist line there, okay? Who's doing the saving? Man is in no way saving himself. It's the grace in God. Very, very strongly Calvinist there, okay? Freely vouchsafed, once more I will renew his lapsed powers, though forfeit and enthralled by sin to foul, exorbitant desires. Upheld by me, yet once more he shall stand, on even ground against his mortal foe. By me upheld, that he may know how frail his fallen condition is, and to me owe all his deliverance. All right. Now... This is different than the whole concept of free salvation or free grace, you know, which is common across all Protestant thought, that there's nothing you can do to, sell for, to earn your salvation or anything like that. Uh, you know, grace alone. This is distinct from that because within some parts of Protestant thought, Protestants who would reject Calvinism there is still the ability on the part of humans to choose that free grace. And what Milton's embracing here is saying, no, you can't, everything's God. So that's where it crosses over from being just about free grace, which would be any type of Protestant, to being specifically on board with the Calvinist ideal idea of unconditional election. Okay? So, some, and then even more so here, he goes, all, so all his deliverance and to none but me, some I have chosen of peculiar grace, elect above the rest, so is my will. So right there, I mean, we've very strong statement of election, but, but, it's 10 lines later, 194 to 197, we get a very strong qualifier on what this means. So now Mil now God starts, after he says that whole statement, then he starts talking about those who aren't among the elect. And he says, And I will place within them as a guide my umpire conscience, whom if they will hear light after light, well used they shall attain, and to the end persisting safe arrive. So within Milton's thought, even those who aren't among the elect still have the possibility of salvation. So it's a strange mixture of Calvinist and non-Calvinist Protestant thought going on here. Milton also retains the idea of the penal substitutionary atonement, which all, all that big phrase means is that uh, when humanity sins, as a result of their sin, there is a penalty owed and God will extract that penalty from someone, and so Jesus, as the incarnate Son, substitutes himself for that penalty and takes it on behalf of humanity. That's not exclusively a Calvinist idea, but you find that Calvinists are much more likely to embrace, and even embrace exclusively, that atonement theory, whereas other Protestants may have a different theory of the atonement, or have multiple theories of atonement that they will interact with. So not strictly in one camp or the other. Uh, we don't want to draw those lines too firmly, but certainly 
more of a Calvinist idea than not. And Milton embraces it. He says, man disobeying, disloyal, breaks his fealty and sins against the high supremacy of heaven. These are lines 203 to 212, by the way. Affecting Godhead and so loosing all to expiate his treason hath not left, but to destruction sacred and devote, he with his whole posterity must die. So there we go, penalty is owed. Die he or justice must, unless for him, some other able and as willing pay the rigid satisfaction, death for death. So, all of humanity is going to die unless somebody comes in and pays the penalty. All right? Substitutionary atonement right there in a nutshell. Milton also embraced imputed righteousness, which again is a largely Calvinistic idea. Uh, in terms of the Calvinist views of justification. We won't get super deep into this, but essentially imputed righteousness means I give Jesus my sin, I impute my sin to him, he imputes his righteousness to me. Okay? A lot of different theories of justification, debates about that. Don't need to worry about that. What we are concerned with is that imputed righteousness, again, maybe even more so than the penal substitutionary atonement, a largely Calvinist idea. So, lines 289 to 94. As many as are restored without the none, this is the Father speaking to the Son, his crime makes guilty all his sons, meaning every, all of humanity is damned through Adam's fall. They merit, imputed, shall absolve them. Or, excuse me, his crime makes guilty all his sons. Thy merit, meaning the son's merit, imputed, shall absolve them who renounce their own both righteous and unrighteous deeds and live in thee transplanted and from thee receive new life. So imputed righteousness right there. Okay, so that's Milton and Calvinism. The other big question that's going on here is what is the relationship between the Father and the Son in this poem. Is it truly Trinitarian? And there's some question marks here as to whether or not Milton is actually uh, believes in Arianism. Now, Arianism is an early Christian heresy that was anti-Trinitarian, okay? So Arius said that the Father and the Son are not both God. The Son is not God. Okay, the, uh, Arius' fav famous phrase was, there was a time when the Son was not. So, the Son is the foremost of all created beings in Arian theology, but he's not on the level of the Father. So, the Father's here, the Son's here, you know, everything else might be down here, but Whereas Trinitarian theology would not only put them on the same level, but intermingle them so that they are three in one, right? The classic Trinitarian th uh, formula, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Arian says, no, Father, Son. Okay? Now, the church, Orthodox Christianity has rejected this, rejected at the Council of Nicaea. Nice fun story there is that St. Nicholas, yes, the real St. Nicholas, punched Arius at the Council of Nicaea because he got so pissed off at what the guy was saying. The Nicene Creed, if you have ever recited that in church, uh, includes a direct refutation to Arianism. So in the Nicene Creed, when we say about the Son, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, those lines directly ref refute Arianism. So, next time you're in church, or if you want to look it up, uh, if you always wondered what some of that stuff meant, well, that's not a very technical explanation of it, but if you're wondering why they're there, that's why. Okay? Milton might be an Arian, though. Because, and there's a couple things uh, that suggest this. The first is that the Son and the Father appear really distinct in this book. Now, we could give dramatic license for that, okay? Uh, the second thing is that the Holy Spirit is nowhere to be found. So this is not a Trinitarian scene. Now, we could say that the Muse invocation is the Holy Spirit at the beginning, and I think there's a lot of merit to that argument, but again, how connected is the invocation scene 
to the actual plot of what's going on. Once we get into the actual drama, the Holy Spirit is nowhere to be found in book three. But then the big one, the really big one, comes after the Son has volunteered to go save humanity. And God says, in lines 341 to 43, very brief passage, but all ye gods, referring to the angels, but all ye gods adore him, who to compass all this dies, adore the Son, and honor him as me. Now let's think about that for a second. So God says to all the angels, honor the Son as me. Which suggests that before this point, the Son was not honored as the Father, which suggests that there's some level of disparity within the heavenly court as to the Father and the Son. Now, how much we want to read into that, that's a matter of literary interpretation. All I want to say is that if you want to make the case that, that Milton is an Arian, or at least has uh, some degree of sympathy for that position, the case is really strong. And we can't, the one argument you cannot use to refute that, in my view, you cannot say that Milton is ignorant of Trinitarian theology, because what we already saw, especially at the beginning, is that he's not. He's very conversant in Trinitarian theology. Remember how we, we talked about how he calls the Son the Son, not Jesus? That's a very strong indication that he, he knows Trinitarian theology enough to realize what he's just said. So, if you want to argue that this is incidental, you can make that case. I don't think you can make it uh, due to Milton's ignorance. Because I don't think he's ignorant on this issue. I think he knows what he's talking about. The evidence strongly suggests that. All right. I know that's a lot on theology. It's a lot on, um, a lot on the conversation in heaven. We'll go through the second part of this book very quickly because... Uh, there's some interesting stuff, but not nearly as technical and detailed as what we just kind of dissected. So, second part of the book, we see Satan arrives at heaven. Well, he actually kind of arrives at like the orb of worlds and he sees all this stuff. And we get here again, if you read kind of the long description of everything he's seen, you'll see a lot of mix of Christian mythology uh, references to the Nephilim and then also Homeric and Greek references to Hermes and all sorts of stuff in Greek mythology. So again, the stuff we talked about last time, the Greek and Christian myth mythologies intermingling, comes back in a big way in that description of everything Satan's looking at. Okay, but then Satan, he sees the glory and beauty of the earth and we get a further contrast between him and the sun because where the sun wants to save this, Satan wants to corrupt it this isn't a new home for him so much as it is something he wants to tear down. He feels jealousy looking at all of this. So that again is a strong mark against, uh, against the notion that Satan is the hero of this story. So first two books, yeah, we can kind of get on board with that. Book three, lots of marks against Satan as the hero. And we'll see how that argument develops going forward, of course. That doesn't mean the book is slammed on which position you can take. We'll, we'll stick with this one throughout. And then finally, he, he kind of goes undercover, he disguises himself, as a, disguises himself as a cherub, and goes and asks the angel Uriel which way to Eden, which way to paradise. And Uriel's tricked, and he tells him, off to paradise we go. And the last thing I want to highlight here with this is I just want to read lines 686 to 691, where I think Melton really has some very beautiful writing about as what's going on with, with Uriel as, as Satan deceives him. And he says, And off the wisdom wake, suspicion sleeps at wisdom's gate, and tis simplicity resigns her charge. Well, goodness thinks no ill where no ill seems, which now for once beguiled Uriel, the regent of the sun, and held the sharpest sighted spirit of all in heaven. In other words, he's there's something just so beautiful and tragic about those lines, right? 
that Uriel is this wise, brave, sharp-sighted, good angel who didn't fall, but now he has to adjust to a world where that's not enough, where now simply being wise and brave, you also have to not be naive and not simplistic. And that whole sense of that when wisdom wakes, often suspicion sleeps. Very, very powerful line. Very tragic line uh, in terms of Milton's development of this world and really of the human condition as well, that it's not enough in the fallen world to be good. Being good gets you killed. I mean, not literally in this case for Uriel, but being good points Satan to par paradise, to Eden. And that's the great tragedy of this line, uh, of that section. So, uh, not a ton to say about Satan's, the rest of Satan's flight to Earth, but uh, we'll pick up with the story then in book four, possibly book five next time. Lots of good stuff in this. I hope you guys are enjoying the analysis. Uh, if you're reading along, I hope you're enjoying the poem. And uh, we'll be back next time. But that's all for now. And I'm Wendy Bond for the Sci-Fi Christian. Goodbye.